Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, welcome to this evening's live stream. Now, this is the last of all live streams before our summer break. So there won't be another one until maybe, I don't know, somewhere around the 22nd of August, something like that. But we'll be carrying on on the Tuesday evenings from sort of mid to late August onwards. But we've got one to go. We've got some very special guests who I will introduce to you in a minute. I mean, do share this if you're watching on social media one form or another. If you're on Facebook, you can share it on Twitter. Uh, you can give it a retweet if you think you'd like to invite other people to watch. And also, if you're watching on Facebook, apparently there's some sort of subscribe button, a notification bell that you could click. Um, if you want to be able to be alerted to these live streams in the future, do click the subscribe button and the notification bell, and that will help ensure that you don't miss us. Again, just that date for your diary. I'll mention it one more time. You're probably fed up hearing about it. 13th of November, uh, Saturday, is going to be our conference, our second uh, in-person annual conference. Our first in-person annual conference was really good, 2019. Uh, we had about 100 people there. We are online last year. It was good as well. And uh, next year, we're hoping for, well, you know, so we have twice as many people, something like that. So it'll be a really good event, uh, Saturday, the 13th of November. Now, during the live stream this evening, if you want to make any comments or ask any questions, do just type those in to either uh, Facebook or YouTube. If you're watching on Twitter, uh, I think you can comment through Periscope. If you click on the video, go to Periscope. You can answer, um, enter questions and comments as well. I might bring some of those on the screen for our special guests, which I will now move on to introducing. Well, the first one needs uh, no introduction. Our very own uh, Phil Tanza up in Durness. Welcome, Phil. Good evening, Richard. Nice to see you again. Yeah, good to have you on the show. Now, Phil's going to be talking to our special guest, because Phil's got a particular interest uh, in this area uh, as well. And our special guest is this evening. Welcome to Sally Ann Burns. Uh, sorry, Burris. Sally Ann Burris, um, who's from Wales and is part of the Split the Difference organization, which looks at equality issues, particularly in the light uh, of, of uh, issues relating to to men. So that's very much an issue that we're interested in as the Scottish Family Party. And Phil's also very interested in it. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So welcome, Sally Ann. Thank you. It's really, really a great pleasure to meet you both tonight. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to what Sally Ann's got to say and listening to Phil's conversation. So I'm going to disappear into the background. I'll be manning the comments. I'll bring comments and questions on as necessary. So I'll leave uh, Phil and Sally Ann to chat and then I'll maybe pop up for the last few minutes and join in if I've got a few questions to ask as well. So, thank you, Richard. Bill, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. Hi, Philip. So, hi, Sally. Uh, good to see you again. Last time we saw each other was uh, two weeks ago or two and a half weeks ago in Edinburgh. We organized the march uh, or the event Marching for Men and Boys together, mm -hmm. which uh, took place one day before Father's Day on a saturday in edinburgh and yep that that event was organized in parts by me and in parts by um split the difference which is your organization i would like for for our audience i would like to ask what is split the difference and what is the focus of your organization so split the difference is a um a campaign for men and boys. The focus is on equality. Um, the target is legislation, guidance, policy, and the way governments and organizations spend their money. It is a UN-facing organization, so it's, it's um, designed to target the 195 countries that are members um, or observers of the United Nations. And the reason that is, is because the research that was completed to open Split the Difference highlighted that um, actually the the issues that men and boys have and the inequalities for them is is kind of situated around the United Nations so we are a, you know a UK based organization but we felt that there wasn't any point really in us trying to address them only in the UK when the the issues that were here were mirrored across the 195 countries I mean over 15 we looked at and they were all the same. So, um, yeah, so we've identified 13 common areas across the countries and they are our target. Okay. Um, could you, before I 
be, uh, I'm quite interested in hearing about these uh, 15 uh, main sectors that you identify. What's your background? How did you end up uh, fun, uh, founding Split the Difference? So I've always delivered frontline services ever since I've ever started working, really. My first career was 10 years in social services um, in the care sector. And then I moved on. Um, I ended up doing a degree in um, I was a psychotherapist um, and other therapies. And I ended up becoming a, a actually a drug and alcohol therapist. From there, I, I delivered I started two organizations. One was called Steps, the other was called Temp to Firm Housing. These delivered frontline services under procurement um, and contracts for local authorities. So those services were floating support and, and um, worked under 16 areas in drug and alcohol, child protection, debt management, you know, housing, homelessness, there's lots of areas. And I delivered temporary accommodation for local authorities. So we had contracts with uh, normal homelessness. Um, uh, contracts and then leaving care teams, uh, uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers, uh, which were 16 to uh, 25 year olds who had come here under asylum status and, and housing and supporting them. And I'd done that for about 14 years. Mum um, got sick, so I, I took a leap of faith. And when we were up for recontracting, I, I closed those two. Um, well, one of them, one of them is still going and did a lot of research. I We'd had half a million Empowering that um, design a, a whole family domestic abuse service centered around the children, which sent me on research that was five years long. And the end result of that was split the difference. All right. So, did your work in that area make you aware of issues around men and boys, or mm -hmm. did you already pick up certain issues beforehand? I mean, services we've always delivered had highlighted that if you were presenting as a man, so if you were going through a homeless process or somebody had independently um, directly tried to access our services, we already knew that there were barriers for men and young boys if they wanted housing or certain types of support like domestic abuse support. Um, as an agency, even though we weren't funded, I felt a social responsibility. So we would do our utmost independently of our contracts to support men um, and young teenagers into housing, education, things like that. Um, but it wasn't until I created the whole family domestic abuse service, we did it as a consortium, that I really dived deep into what was the research, the stats, you know, the evidence. Um, and, and I was really shocked. Uh, I mean, part of when you deliver services, frontline services, and and I, I would say that I was extremely well networked. I, I was part of consultation groups and, you know, strategic mapping and planning groups. And I was always very, very active. And when you when you're in that zone, um, you, you kind of lull yourself into thinking, I know what I'm doing. And I was very, very active and completing that contract took me into uh, research that I had not, I, I'd never gone through the layers down, down, down into some deep layers around, you know, things like you, you get presented with, um, if you go into a strategic mapping or planning group, you get presented with your, your paperwork and it's right, this is what our objective is, this is what we're working on, we're reviewing this or that, you know, reviewing a uh, voucher SV or we're reviewing an act of law legislation and, and then you'll feed into that. But what I'd never done before is take what what that was and then looked at down through the layers. How was it formulated? Who who was consulted with it? You know, um, why are we reviewing it? And that kind of opened up a huge piece of knowledge I'd never had. And um, and it was so. So would you, okay. So would you say that you were working in these fields and being highly qualified, but actually kind of blind? to yeah. some underlying issues because you were uh, completely surrounded by the system and the system kind of made sense in itself because um, it was an echo chamber. Is, is that a correct that's interpretation? A very, that's a very correct interpretation. When when consultation groups and, and guidance and legislative, you know, kind of review groups and all of these things take place, there is an agenda and you've stepped into that zone with a set agenda. 
And you, and you you know, for me, I, I mean, at some times I've been in this role for 25 years or in this this um, kind of environment for 25 years, delivering a myriad of services that, you know, that I could list as long as my arm. And, and you believe that you know what you know because you're actually delivering it, you're managing staff, your procurement, yeah. you know. But it's not until you actually step out of that guidance for this meeting zone and you look at it, these, this stuff independently and you really pull in, you know, the additional stuff that you're not being fed, that you actually see the whole picture. Uh, and that's what happened with this, this last piece of work that I'd done. Uh, I, I, we'd, because it was a whole family domestic abuse service, we'd ended up creating it. It spent a lot of money to do that and then not having pilot money. And I, I'd gone into, you know, the government zone to look for pilot money because they'd paid for this. I felt that they needed some responsibility in making sure that it had the chance to thrive. And doing that took me into a preparation document for Welsh Government. And that's when I looked at the, the research independently of anything else. Um, and you're right, that's exactly what happens. Obviously, in the last year that I've been working on, on, in my organization, Gender Parity, U, uh, Gender Parity UK, I, I've been through the same process in many ways, like looking into certain uh, research numbers, comparing them with what the public narrative is in regards to, for example, domestic abuse and how many victims are female, how many victims are male. and. It's it's really shocking when you when you see oh that doesn't add up the the research shows something completely different than what the mainstream narrative is mm -hmm. and to to highlight one of the issues and I talked about this here in the Scottish Family Party live stream two weeks ago that in Scotland the NHS routinely asks all women if they experience domestic abuse while not at explicitly not asking men and the uh, like the excuse or the reasoning for that was that men are far less likely to be victims and they might feel uncomfortable being asked and um that there is no proof that asking men if they experience domestic abuse would have any positive impact <laughs> Which obviously is a circular argument. The reason why there are far less uh, victims being identified is because nobody asks men and mask of men are far less likely to speak out about it. Um, so the numbers are low and then, then they're saying, oh, because the numbers are low and because men don't want to talk about it, we're not asking them. And it creates this, this loop uh, that that just keeps the narrative alive that it's almost exclusively women that experience domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of this is around, you've got professionals who, if they know there is no, there is no referral process to assist men. So if you're a nurse in a, in a hospital unit who is recognizing something because you've got somebody coming through the doors repeatedly, there is no system in place that will capture those men and help them through whatever they're going through anyway. And and yeah. when I read policies, on, you know, I mean, part of what I did was, if we take family court law, I took 20, there's 21 acts of legislation that input on a decision made in family court law. And I looked at all the 21 um, pieces of legislation and the guidance that came from that. And I looked at the relationships. So for example, if you look at um, children's services, social services, children in need, those kinds of um, assessments that some families go through, um, if they've got a, a violent relationship within the family, often children's services are involved. So if you look at the practices within children's services, and then if you look at housing, you've got a court system that will say to you, okay, so children's services are involved because the children need to be safe. And then the court is trying to consider whether the children can spend time with mum and dad. Housing law has got its own remit about how it gives housing to a parent, right? Um, yeah. And if uh, under local housing regulations, if a parent, if children are with a parent safely, they won't they won't accept responsibility for providing the other parent with suitable accommodation for children to go and stay with them. So you've got direct you've got a direct issue between one and the other. Children's services won't yeah. allow the court to to give um, parental 
uh, some parental visitation to a, a parent that hasn't got suitable, suitable accommodation. That's one piece of legislation. Then you've got housing fighting against that. And you've got a court system then that has to make decisions with with a disabled father or or, or a mother. It, you know, it 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 could be either way, mostly with men, unfortunately. Um, those are these piece of legislation that directly fight against each other. When we looked yeah. at health, and so 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 the the parent who doesn't have the child is already on a on a more difficult path, yeah. and and that obviously spirals more and more more. Out of control, I would assume something something that you can also see with uh, certain things like addiction and homelessness. Once you are in that spiral, it it just it's very hard to get out of that. Now, I would like to to go back to the issues because we already touched on uh, domestic abuse, and you mentioned uh, far, uh, issues with being a father. I assume these are two of the fifteen areas that you identified with split the difference is, is that correct yeah um, can it, i ask you what what are the different all the different issues that you identified if you know them offhand uh, uh, so we have um the, the the there's 13 areas um as i said there were 13 oh, my bad. yeah there are 13 common denominated areas um the the areas are are a health education um, the gathering of statistics is one of the area. Court and the associated services, um, legal representatives, because um, unfortunately the systems that um, operate, at, you know, people like solicitors, barristers, those legal systems and the people within them are governed by certain requirements and code of conduct, funding and so on. Um, so they were one of the areas that had an impact on men particularly when they were going through family court. Um, social services and children's services, police and associated services with another because um, th there's issues around when, when a man presents, for example, if it's domestic abuse, then the way that the police kind of process his claim, a ma for example, a man has to prove that he's been abused, whereas a woman just needs to say she is. Can then I... Can I yeah, can sorry. I share? Uh, can I share an experience there? Sorry for interrupting you. No, uh, that's in, in my research, in my research, I went to the website of a, a local council, and they it was very good because they had support for male and female victims of domestic abuse, and they, it was two different pages, and it mm -hmm. says click here for female victims of domestic abuse, and it said if you experience domestic abuse, please called this hotline and there are safe spaces and for men it said if you experience domestic abuse um collect evidence take videos um mm. inform friends and, and it had this long list of things that a man had to do that a woman didn't have to do yeah. because they were aware that a male victim is less likely to be believed now I really appreciated the the honesty in these two different pages. Mm -hmm. I was because it just showed that even the council was aware that mm -hmm. men are less likely to be believed. Mm, I know, I, and you see that within all, like you see that within family court processes. You see it with where you've got divorce cases. Um, you see it there. You see it within police services and the associated services wrapped around that. For example. You know, victim support and the response services that are in in place when somebody presents. I mean, you see it in all avenues. Men, men have to prove that they are victims, and and sometimes it's. I mean, from a therapist's point of view, what that does is re-traumatize. We know that. We know that for a fact. So, you know, having having these services that on multiple levels are not supporting men and sometimes teenage men you know 16 17 year old boys who've got in they've come from environments that are violent and they've gone into violent teenage relationships you know so we're not talking about just grown men we're talking about teenage men and these services through lots for lots of different reasons are not providing with the care and the attention and the equality that men deserve it's not even that you know it's not even a choice they, they it's a right it's a right that yeah. they they should have the exactly same choice and behaviours coming from professionals as women do, um, and, yeah. and it's something that we feel quite passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I, I would actually like to 
to mention a comment that, that is in the comment section by somebody uh, with the name Jack. And it says, equality is a communist ideal. Um, if you have freedom, you don't, do not have equality. Now, I don't want to go into the, the, the communist part, but in regards to equality, there are a lot of different approaches to equality. Of course, you have equality of outcome, which I would completely agree is a communist ideal, but you, have, you also have equality under the law. And that is something that can be achieved um, and should be the norm. It would be so easy to just say that uh, male and female victims of certain crimes or men and women should be treated equal uh, under the law. But that is in, in many cases not the case. And I would, I would like to ask you, with all these uh, inequalities that you have or issues, I, I'm, I want to say issues, not just inequalities that you have identified in regards to men, what are the root causes? And I know it's a huge, it's a huge topic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but where do you see the big issues both socially and also politically we've got a narrative in society that says women are victims and men are perpetrators and i know that's a very generalistic term but if you look at the depth of evidence we looked at that premise is threaded throughout so many areas. I mean, the last year of the research that I did was on societal narrative. So I looked at TV, music, news, uh, film, um, pop culture. I looked at trends, um, beauty, sport. I mean, the list was endless on the narratives within that and how, you know, how, how all different countries, it wasn't just in the UK. I looked at America and lots of other countries. That societal narrative is wrapped up. So if you, you know, you, you can constantly, oh, he's just been a man or, you know, there's lots of negative narrative language that's threaded and it's an accepted norm. You know, it's, it's definitely an accepted norm. So you've got this kind of, you've got this premise that people have believed and bought into for, for many years um, that men are always going to be the problem and women are always going to be the victim of that problem. And, and no matter where you get away from it, we all recognize that, you know. I mean, in some, to some degrees, you know, there's a competition, there's a gender competition, there's a, a battle of the sexes that can be, you know, in some cases can be really, you know, it's, it's, it's going out on a quiz night and the boys, you know, boys, you know, play the girls and stuff like that. And in some contexts, this is something that is charming. But in terms of, you know, the disrespect and the, competition that's in a professional context is just not acceptable even just flippant remarks around you know i mean these things about man spreading and and you know misogyny and and you know i i toxic men i i mean they are they're just awful terms and they're constantly batted throughout many narratives in the sports field in you know in general news form you see them constantly wrapped around media and social media so the, you've got that. It's a constant drip into our minds and our hearts all of the time, and then in a political. But what, what, what would you? But what would you say? Where, where's, what's the source of that uh, disregard for male suffering and the negative depiction of male as a as a group? What do you think is the I, root cause? There is I one. Think, I think you've got a group of women in society who are wrapped around the world um part of the research because i looked at feminism i wanted to look at feminism because where all my research this was cropping up every single time and i looked at narratives from influencers um some of it was done through the un women because they are they are collectively networked across the whole of the world and and i looked at these layers within this kind of you know mainstream feminist movement and and i mean it's profoundly um heartbreaking to see what they are doing and how they are manipulating governance and policy and influences in society with terms of reference that are not backed up by any kind of research at all 
and some of the statements that you make because because I'm a bit of a fact checker and I don't like watching things and then somebody making a statement and I'm like, okay, let's have a look at that. I mean, in 6.2 of the water goal, you'll see that women, by 2030, women will be free from, uh, water will be free from defecation, particularly for women and girls. So you take statements like that and what I did in societal news and general stuff and these bold statements by these very, very powerful women I was taking these statements, extracting them, and then looking at where the evidence was for that statement. And I never found it. I never, I've never once found a, a, an extreme feminist opinion that was backed up by evidence. And there's something really wrong about that. And, and there needs yeah. to be accountability, you know. Um, from a female perspective, a, a woman who wants power control or, or she wants to succeed in her career when she calls other women victims she's stepping on them she's she's choosing to call us a victim in society to get what she wants it's not what we want um it's what she wants and i and and i take umbrage to this and and I, and it's a definite network all over the world and and i mean in in fairness some of these women because i have challenged some of these women um and some of these women were as ignorant um to, to actually the facts. They've just picked this narrative up. They've put it on themselves like an overcoat that makes a noise and they've just run with it. And when you you directly question them, they're like, no, that can't be, you know? So uh, so I, there needs to be- you, But, but, but in, in, in some ways you have experienced something similar because you were in this field and you were unaware of certain things. Yes. Is, is that correct to say? Yeah, that is very, very correct. And, and to some great, because when, if you've done the research and there's many people that have you get to a point where you feel really angry you thinking how did I not know this I've been a professional for 25 years you know I've delivered services at all levels you know I've been a critical friend for local authorities so I'm not somebody who's ignorant you know so how didn't I know this stuff what was going on that I wasn't told or I just didn't see it and you buy into that and then you get angry you know you get quite angry about that so it has allowed me to empathize, you know, and to say to these ladies, so the first two years of our campaign is, did you know, you know, did you know that this is what the truth is? And once you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, because you have a responsibility. Uh, this is, I would like to tie that in with a question from uh, yeah. somebody in the audience. Uh, I think his name is Stephen Hetterly. Uh, the question is, if you say you have a narrative, how would you get more realist? How would you get a more realistic narrative out there? I think there needs to be. I think we. I mean, from the campaign's perspective, is to look at the societal narrative and challenge that. Um, and we're actively trying to do that now. Um, I think you know, there's got to be this thing around setting set in a platform where people understand what that narrative needs to look like. I mean, one of the things that we ask guys to do, um, and it's because unfortunately men tend to be quiet, you know, they do tend not to speak out. So one of the things, um, Stephen, just to let you know, is that we we are starting to ask men that once they've been challenged, if if they're in a vicinity of somebody who says something negatively about men and their perception of women or the world or parenting or whatever, we're asking them to turn around and just say, well, actually, you know, this is I'm a man and this is what I think and this is what my friends think and then be real and honest with that. We're not asking them to challenge this in a fight way, but just to say, well, actually, that's not what I believe, you know, own who you are, drop the mic, turn away and walk it away, you know, because men need what society doesn't know is that men have depth, you know, they have interest, they have heart, they are you know they've silenced these things for fear of being condemned or being you know fitted in a box so men do need to take responsibility and say well actually i'm a guy and that's not what i think and i'm not mm -hmm. what's this thing about toxic men i well, i don't understand that you know challenge that narrative yourself in a way you can do the drop you might turn away walk away that's one way of doing it you know you can't expect change unless you're going to say you need it you know, and it's one of the things I hear from from governance and stuff is that, oh, yes, Sally, we know that men need these things. They just don't tell us. I mean, I do challenge that and say, well, you should ask and consult. And when they fill the forms in and say they want to be part, you accept them and you don't block them doing that. 
but men do need to speak you know they do need to stand up and say actually you're wrong but but there i would say there is a real problem nowadays as a straight white male Uh, you are part of the oppressor group and you are immediately be being silenced as um, as misogynist, uh, racist, homophobe. Uh, there is this, this targeted approach to silence certain groups when, when they start speaking out and expressing their own experience of life. And I would like to, to take that in a, in a certain direction here. Have you heard of critical race theory? Yes, yes, I have you okay. heard about it. I know that you are very, very busy, so maybe you haven't picked up on that. But mm -hmm. currently in America, there is a strong pushback against so-called critical race theory. And for the audience, for the people that don't know what that is, critical race theory is in broad strokes um, It says that there is an oppressor group and there is an oppressed group and the oppressor group are white people and the oppressed group are people of color as whole groups and it implies that all societies, all Western societies are built on white supremacy and that we have to eliminate or get rid of or reduce whiteness in in the pursuit to uh, create equality of outcome with, as Jack said earlier, is a communist uh, approach. Now, critical race theory is being taught, or parts of critical race theory is being taught in many schools in America and in quite a few universities here and colleges here in, in the UK as well. The Equalities Minister Kami Badenoch recently came out and spoke out against it and said this is divisive, this tells white people they are evil and black people that they are the victims. Now I think that the same thing has go been going on in regards to gender for the last 40 years. And, um, and gender studies and even in normal subjects, uh, teachers that have Uh, whether they know it or not, that have a Marxist leaning because the narrative that women are the victims, men are the perpetrators, is just another version of uh, the um, oppressor, oppressed approach of Marx. Now, the people are starting to criticize critical race theory, but it seems like nobody is making the connection to feminism and that feminism has been doing that for a very long time. And I think we are starting, the, the cultural immune system is starting to actually react to critical race theory. And it might be prudent to actually tell the cultural immune system, hey, don't just attack this because there's this other big problem in like, feminism that has been in the school system for decades what what are your thoughts on that sorry that was a long monologue no it's okay it's okay i mean i agree i think things like these theories divide um i think that it's not um as a therapist there is a term called blame and shame and we're in a blame and shame culture it's the same thing we need a victim to blame um, and to shame, and what it ultimately gives is control, and it mm -hmm. it 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 kinds of keep it keeps people set in this victimhood where they don't thrive at all. They just don't thrive, and and when you have this blame and shame culture, and you point fingers and you say, you know, okay, you're white, so you suppress me, or you know, or or you're you know, I'm a woman, so I'm suppressed by men and society. People climb above other people by using this technique when you blame and shame when you blame somebody um and you shame them into doing something first of all you silence them you stop yeah. they stop right you shut them up the second thing that happens is somebody within that relationship thrives you it's, it, it's the way of stepping on another human being or a race or a culture um and that somebody will thrive from that for sure you know um i'm I, i'm The work I do, I purposely do not get involved in in sort of 
politics per se in, in as much as I don't align myself with with any particular party and the only reason I don't do that is because I believe that having equal rights equal choices and human rights is is above all of that it is just a very basic level that every single party across the world should take responsibility for it doesn't matter who you are you know it is a, a basic responsibility that everybody should have I think that from what I've seen about this critical race theory and from what I've seen about extreme feminism, it is about a group of people who want control and power. And the way that they're doing that is by turning a, a particular group of people into victims. Because And, and oddly enough, um, it is normally the ones that they're trying to turn into victims are the ones that need to climb above and have some control. And, and I don't, I mean, I listened to a, a video, um, it was a documentary and it was highlighting what it was like to grow up in, in the UK as a black child. And they, they interviewed the people from Caribbean and lots of different countries. And when I was listening to it, you know, there were lots of young, they were young adults who'd had lots of issues growing up in the schoolroom and things like that. And I listened to it and I got a teaching qualification and I've worked and I've taught in communities and with children who were out of education. And what I was hearing was the child that's got red hair, the child that's too fat, too tall, too skinny, um, the child that may be black or brown or, or the, you know, the child that maybe he's got a speech impediment. But what I was seeing and hearing was children who batter each other for whatever reason, whether you've got glasses or whatever, and, and I don't want to diminish at all everybody, anybody's experience. But I remember thinking and thinking, well, if, if everybody understood that that is, you know, I mean, I was overweight in school, so I had the same kind of, you know, narrative coming. There was a reason to bully me and to be mean and whatever. But it, it was about being a victim, you know. And, and I looked at the people that were on the show and thinking, but... You're incredible. One was a musician, one, you know, one was a philosopher. There was lots of different reasons behind their education. And I thought to myself, this narrative is suppressing you and making you feel you're inadequate. What's that about? You know? And and this is what feminism does. In extreme feminists, this is what it does. It it, it chooses to make women victims, whether it's because of employment, education, being a stay-at-home mum, you know, and it steps on women to achieve what? Inequality for men and boys, you know. That's, so that's what I actually wanted to say because um, you said if some if one group is suppressed, the other one thrives. But it does. Uh, I would say, but unfortunately, that is not really the case. Women are not thriving. Mm -hmm. They might be thriving politically or economically, uh, but the the happiness index uh, for women is going down uh, decade by decade. So actually yeah. women now are far less happy. And it's, I, I think it's that, that extra pressure that is put on women. They have to work, they like, they have to achieve everywhere. And the mm -hmm. pressure of being the victim at the same time and mm -hmm. being capable of everything, obviously there are so many like, conflicting messages being sent out to women and obviously to men that it, I think it makes everybody miserable. I agree with you. I mean, we've got women who want to stay at home and are being told they have to work and women who, you know, who, I mean, you have to be in a boardroom to be a successful woman. Why would I need mm -hmm. to be in the boardroom? That's not part of my identity. What I want is choice. If I want to yeah. stay at home, mum, I would love to have been a stay-at-home mum. You know, these pressures that you're putting on women, some women who are not having their families until they're in their late 30s, when they're struggling to have families at that time, because they've bought into this, I have to be educated to be a successful woman, I have to go to university, I have to climb to the top of my field. You know, if that's what you want, so be it. But being told that you can't achieve or you've got to struggle and fight and, and whatever, and you deny other parts of yourself, um, this is not this is not what women want. Women just want to be able to choose. So it okay. doesn't surprise me, you know. Okay, so, so so we have the data that men experience disadvantages in many, many fields. And we have the fact that women are actually not super happy nowadays. Um, why can't we just change it? Who prevents us? from getting the message out there? Why are we not being heard and why? Because these are realities. 
yeah. usually realities should be quite obvious and easy to advocate for, but we are really struggling to being heard. Who, who's in our way or what's in our way? You have a system throughout, if you're talking about policy and services, because, I mean, for us, we are looking at why legislation and guidance doesn't allow services to get the funding they need to support men with the choices that they, they you know, they have the right to have. I mean, the systems are blocked. Uh, prime example is the domestic abuse bill, only because it's now and it's relevant. It's not the only thing. There's lots around health and well-being and things, but and education. But if we use the domestic abuse bill as an example, there was a consultation process that went out last year. Um, we know that a number of female services um, applied to be part of the consultation and female victims or survivors applied. We also know the same for men and um, men's groups. They accepted all the women's groups and all the, the female survivors and they didn't accept any, any of the men's groups or the men's survivors. So the consultation process was biased. What we know about the consultation process was that I watched four days of that process, okay, because I, I need to get my head around it. So I watched parliamentary TV and I watched four Me days. Too. Of that. Me too, yeah. So when you sit and you listen to it, what you realize is the committee members are aligned with women's groups, have done projects, settings, um, they've been supporters of female groups and, and the work they've done for many years. So you're instantly seeing a committee that's already biased there's no there's no neutrality there at all um there's if you watch it long enough you'll see oh i remember when we did that project together do you remember a direct a, a direct comment made to women's aid by one of the committee members yeah. so you've got a, a, you've got a bias you know I, I mean i don't know i read the code of conduct i know the strategies in place for consultation i know the requirements for those because i've read all of the documents that the government work by there is no way that situation should have been allowed and there needs to be accountability and things like that. This happens in education, health. You know, we've got this women's health thing going on right now. Um, so is, is, there, is, is, it, is it fair to say that there is, and this is going to be a leading question because we, we obviously we know each other and we, we okay. work on certain things. So, so this is going to be a leading question. Um, is there... Is that a lobbying problem and who influences who? I mean, we, we looked into certain things and, for example, the so-called Victims Commissioner and the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, they have all worked with women's organizations and are currently working with these women's organizations. And as soon as something, there is a proposal to create more gender equality in for example, domestic abuse legislation, they directly oppose that. Mm. Uh, am, am I fair to say that? That's I'm not exaggerating the situation, am I? No, not at all. And I mean, it, I, I, I don't know whether all women are like this, but I, uh, I have less tolerance for women who don't do their job well than I would uh, for anybody. And the reason being is because we've been drip fed that women are better at doing these things. And then you get women in positions of power who have the perfect opportunity to bring good values and ethics to it and to be able to stand up with courage and they choose not to. The Victims Commissioner was part of the domestic abuse consultation. She was in, in parliamentary TV at the time. Yeah. I have no, I, I mean, and this is, I strongly, I, I mean, I don't know whether they'll ever watch this, but I strongly say you are women that should not be in your role. And there is accountability for a code of conduct. I've read it. I've read the code of conduct. And I think there is a duty by those who manage these women to hold them accountable and to stand up and not be fearful of what they're going to get as a comeback. Because there are women like me who are professional, who have worked hard all their life and understand they're learned. I, I've got multiple qualifications and lots of women who do what I do, who are working to support men and boys, are in the same premise that these women need to be accountable. I mean, it is so... It, it, there's, a, there's an awful term in services, in frontline services that I've heard for about 15 years. And what it says is that services are often incestuous. And the term is used, that incestuous word is used because there is, there is something that happens to services when people are so connected that they show bias in their job role and their profession. It is seen in education, research, you know, 
funding for research and, and, and actions through that. It is seen in lots of different services. But I have never seen something that is so, so, so disgusting, you know, in, in terms of guidance, legislation, you know, governance, influencing. And, and these women, they, they're connected. I could literally draw a dot right across the UK in these services and I can show you where these women are connected. And, and I, it, uh, I would like to give an example of this bias um, and coming back to Scotland. When I think three years ago, coercive control became part of uh, the umbrella term of domestic abuse, uh, something that a lot of organization worked ver very hard for. And I'm, I'm fully in favor of that. I was at that time talking with somebody very high up in the police who worked on, on that as well. And when coercive control was being made part of uh, domestic abuse. There was, there were TV ads produced by the Scottish government, and they were exclusively for female victims, and were so heavily gendered. And they even said, if he tells you what you should wear, if he tells you that he doesn't like your makeup. That's coercive control, that's domestic abuse. A lot of these things are just com normal things in a relationship where you just tell each other, oh, like how many women tell their husbands, you're not wearing that shirt tonight because it's dirty. That can of, of course be abusive if it happens all the time, but it was depicted as if normal behaviors in a relationship were abusive. Now these ads were so gendered, the police, the man from the police i can't i can't say how high up he was he told me that the police did not put their seal of approval to this tv ad because it was so gendered because the police wanted this law to be gender neutral and protect everybody and he was fighting very hard for it and i was in contact with him because of that and the tv ad was intentionally being made very gendered and Nicola Sturgeon came out in and had a speech also for TV. And she said, finally, we have another bill in regards to domestic abuse to protect women. And behind her, there was a blackboard. And on the blackboard, there were, um, it was scribbled um, in shark, uh, charcoal, uh, women's aid, save lives, and I think refuge was written down as well which are the three leading uh, female and feminist domestic abuse uh, support organizations. That's how deep it goes. Mm, I know, and, I know. Yeah, but, I mean, how, I, how can you, ex how can you I, expect the laws to be applied equally? You can't. Yeah, there needs to be accountability. Um, I, I think what these women don't realize is what we found over the last 18 months is that we've got a lot of women that are lining through LinkedIn, through through the projects that we're running, through the consultations that we, you know, and we've got a lot of professional women who are now aligning to us and saying, somebody's got to do something about this because, you know, how how you can put governance, I mean, these are women who shouted long enough and hard enough to the point where nobody wants to face them. Well, there are a group of women who are educated who want to face them and want to hold yeah. them accountable. And I think that's what's coming from this. I mean, this is how short-sighted this is. Women who, who only focus on one gender, they, they are locking out their sons, their grandsons, their brothers, their fathers. They are also locking out because when a man is harmed, then the women within his life who love him are also harmed. We talk, we've had, we, you know, when, when murder is... And, and vice versa. And it, vice, it, vice versa. I mean, what, like... That, that's why we have to protect everybody. Um, exactly. it, it, it cannot be a gender war where men fight for themselves or for women and women just fight for themselves. No. It, it was never supposed to be like that. I mean, there's a, there, for us, what we believe is there is there is a there's a kind of an overarching kind of world governance that says that men and women should be treated the same within law and that it should be untouchable within guidance, if there's one man who is experiencing something that 50,000 women are, his needs and his choices should still be the same. 
and that's where governance is because we've got fit it's quite wacky our world actually almost covers 50 percent women 50 percent men that's that's what it is you know and and laws and legislation throughout these countries should allow that amount of access and choice and it shouldn't be a gender battle um, and, and I think in a modern day society, you know, we, we everybody's saying, you know, we're modern human rights, you know, we, we need empathy, whatever. These are this is the very basic thing, you know, and we should get that right. If nothing else, yeah. we got to get that one thing right, because otherwise we're never going to thrive. Families won't thrive, you know, societies won't thrive and, and we got to get it right. And these ladies, I mean, for me, your time is up because you've got a lot of ladies coming behind you who are saying that's not on and it's not acceptable and, and you need to be held accountable. You know, uh, you don't have to step on other women just to get what you want because that's what you're doing. You know, you're stepping on mums and grandmothers and you're stepping on everybody and that is enough, enough. Before I ask you the last question, I would like to read a comment from uh, somebody. His profile name is Big AI FI Gala. Okay. I, I, I fi, big I fi gala. Okay. We need to be encouraging young people to settle down and have families for many reasons. One is the reason for keeping one is a reason for keeping off the streets and out of trouble. I think I think that is one positive aspect, but I think the whole of society would absolutely benefit from people, young people to get into committed relationships. And, but for that, they have to learn to take responsibilities, full responsibilities. And I don't think that at the moment, young people are being taught how to take responsibility and also how to, like boys are, boys are not taught that they deserve respect. Mm -hmm. um, women are not taught accountability. Um, most young people are, are not being taught what real happiness actually means, that happiness does not only lay in uh, academic outcome and making a lot of money, but also in maybe starting a family. So I think there are a lot of real issues. And yes, we, we have to we have to save the young people. I would agree with that. Now, my last question to you, Sally, is what political change would you like to see in the near future in Scotland, if you know anything about Scotland, in the UK and internationally? What change do you want to see? I want to see voices and consultation groups that are set up and aligned um, immediately that they're considered. So, for example, we've got a women's health at the moment. In what society would you not explore a men's health? You know, where where can you put a consultation group up that focuses on one when health should for the health should serve the two? And if you need to have separate groups, fine. Just make sure you have separate groups. You've got a lot of agendas currently in Scotland that need to be looked at and explored. And and I can't, for me, you set them up so that they have equal choice, equal voice, you know, in each setting. That's the only thing that you can do. If you're not, you know, every time a woman says, you know, women need, women need what? Support in some element, education or whatever and you set up these groups and you look and review or revisit um, legislation or guidance or anything, I don't understand how you how any society doesn't allow men to have a voice within that. Men need to speak, but they're not given a pathway to do it. So for me, it's that. You've got, the only way, you know, I want to review everything. If you asked me, I wanted to review everything that ever existed. Our premise is, that the acts of law and governance are reviewed to include men and boys, you know? Mm -hmm. But the, the place to start that doesn't cost anything and doesn't ask people to rewind is anything from this point onwards includes men and boys. This health thing that's going on currently, this review in women's health, we know through research, women with cervical cancer and breast cancer, there's automatic screening there. With testicular cancer and prostate cancer, there's no screening. I mean, they're basic things and they kill men as much as they kill women in their, yeah. their given things. No screening. And men, and men die five years younger. Men are more reluctant to actually 
uh, go to a doctor. So there are many, many reasons why there should be a focus on men. And there is a responsibility within governance to make sure they serve all. And if they don't, they need accountability in place to do it. So for me, that's a very basic place to start. You've got a, you've got a consultation group going. You make sure that you've got people. You drag them kicking and screaming if you have to. But you make sure you've got equal representation. That's one place, you know. No, Sally, we both work towards uh, like get actually getting a minister for men yes into the uk government yes. because there has been a minister for women and a minister for women and equalities and a lot of other representation especially and often exclusively for women and we think that to bring that counterbalance there there needs to be a minister for men and i because when you just said that there should be representation for men and boys uh, i think that sounds nice but i think it's it might be unrealistic because we're so used to this this biased and, and gendered approach that there actually needs to be one person or somebody who looks at uh, or who makes sure that male voices are being heard would you agree with that I mean, I do. The one thing about a minister for men is um, once somebody is situated within that role, there is a natural pathway that has to open up through all those consultation processes. So every time they're going to review something or every time they're going to look at something, when there is a minister in situ, they are then automatically given a pathway into what avenue, whatever avenue is currently on the table for the for the government. Um, now it's one role it's one role but it will have a huge knock-on effect and and i don't understand i mean for me i you know me philip i have got a really no nonsense approach and there's no justification for the way things are and and they never will be and anybody who tells you it is you just need to say to me you're wrong but a minister for men will naturally create pathways into education into health into homelessness into domestic abuse into anything that serves society and it's a no-brainer for me and yep. I don't see how anybody can argue against it. And you've got MPs at the moment. We are targeting MPs. We we talk to them. We we ask people to notify their MPs. We've got letters on the website saying just send it into your MP and request it. These MPs are there for a reason, and they need to stand up and and be counted. Do your job. You know you that's what you're there for. And how you can deny that a minister for men shouldn't be there is beyond anybody's common sense. So, as, you know, as you can see, I'm really passionate about it. But, yeah, I, I mean, it is what it is. You need it. You've got to have it. Do something about it. Sort it out. It's as simple as that. In, in the communication with uh, political representation, and we wrote a lot of letters, what mm -hmm. I find quite disheartening is that the female politicians that we contacted almost exclusively almost exclusively completely dismissed yeah. um, the idea that men deserve representation mm -hmm. and i am by no means saying that uh, women don't care about men as a whole but unfortunately it seems that women that end up in positions of power mm -hmm. seem to end up in this possession with an agenda mm -hmm. And that to me is scary, mm -hmm. that even some conservative women that end up in these positions are still indoctrinated with feminist mm -hmm. agenda saying, well, men, well, men don't need support. That to me is, is really scary because I want, uh, I, I want to see women just as politicians mm -hmm. uh, based on their merit. And there are some amazing poli female politicians out there, for example, Liz Truss or Kemi Badenoch. Uh, but a lot of the female politicians and some of the male politicians that we contacted, it was very disheartening and quite embarrassing what they responded to the simple request for equality. I think I honestly believe some of these people, unfortunately, are very ignorant. And I think what they do is they have things landed in front of them on their desk and they deal with whatever they're going to deal with from the civil servants who, who assist them. And I think some, I think they're in a position where they really need to understand what's going on and they need to take control of that. When when people like, you know, Gender Parity UK and the Minister for Men and, and my own organisation and many more that are now growing um, and becoming more well known, 
are saying you need to look at this, then they need to listen. And I mean, with Kemi Badenoch and, and Liz Truss, you've got women there who, who are on the right path, but I believe they need to be supported to do that. A lot of women who get into positions of power, yeah, I believe, a lot of women that get into positions of power, they get there being handheld through a woman's movement. They are the women who are not gonna step out. They're not courageous. They haven't got the courage that is needed to stand up. Those women need to be held accountable. But I, with other women and men, they need to be supported and said, we are out here, we're educated, we know what we're talking about, we can stand up with facts and evidence, and we can face those who are trying to suppress what is an equal right for men. You need to use us. You need to, to understand what we can give you, and you need to, to be supported by us. We, we, have, we have noticed that, um, that there are huge uh, propaganda campaigns from mm -hmm. women's organizations with public funding um, yes. that uh, directly target politicians and the House of Lords with, um, with very specific information, I would say propaganda because most mm -hmm. of it is based on lies, yes. um, to, to push them or even sometimes bully them into a certain direction. And voices like ours are just pretty, pretty much uh, drowned out. Mm. Uh, hello, Richard. You're back. Hello. <laughs> did you listen Fasc to us? I did. Fascinating discussion. I've, I've got two points I can make. What do you think of this? Now, you, you're saying how frustrating it is trying to influence MPs, MSPs, whatever. But it's the Scottish Family Party. Phil, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? What am I going to say? I mean, we, we, we're not here to. It's a family party. We think they're not going to change. You've got to replace them. But yeah. That's what democracy is all about. We, we can replace them. Now, in the Westminster electoral system, that's a pretty remote possibility of actually being able to, you know, two-party system, being able to get in there. Uh, but in Scotland, uh, it's a bit different. So, so we're we're always saying to people, basically, the MSPs, the MPs, they're, they're, they're pretty well a lost cause, and the parties certainly. So we think it, it's election day. When, the, when there's the real possibility. Now, here's my other point. Let's see what you think about this. You said about a minister for men. Mm -hmm. well, the other solution to the inequality, of course, is to uh, ditch the minister for women. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, do you think if you have a minister for men, do you think that might s sort of open the door or make people think, oh, well, we also need a, a minister for white people and Asian people and black people. Mm -hmm. But we need mm -hmm. a minister for gay people and straight people. We need a minister for transgender people. But we need... And, and it goes on and on. Do you think it would be better if, if there were just there was no such thing as ministers for particular groups like can, that? Can I can I go first? Uh -huh. yes. um, there is a real problem, and the problem is called gamma bias. Um, there's a amazing so it's, video, it's called what gamma bias. Um, right, there's okay. an amazing video on YouTube. If you type in gamma bias, um, it's created by one uh, like two of our friends. And it's the concept that I'm, I'm going to make it really short that people just care less about men, and that will right. always be the, the case, and and that's a fact. Now, but if you get rid of the um, minister for women, the structures will still be in place. The structures uh -huh. that that have been trained over decades to benefit women over men will still be in place. And there needs to be somebody who actually almost aggressively or, 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 or clearly attacks these structures by putting his or her foot in the door. Um, that, that's what I would answer to that. Unfortunately, if you have been in, in a system that was so heavily gendered in one direction, you need for a time a uh, representation for the other one. Sally, what would you say? Yeah, I think the same. I mean, the pathways of consultation and inclusion for the Minister for Women and Equalities, for example, it's a bit like a capillary, you know. It's a thread of capillaries that goes down in different stages, consultation groups, COVID, whatever it is. It's automatically threaded in through all of those consultations. To extract that from there, I think would be far more difficult than to align the equality in there is by putting somebody who acts and is the voice for men. I mean, I doubt very much, you know, 
when you give something, people say, okay, we'll take it. But when you try and take something away from somebody, they will, I mean, you, I, I honestly believe you, you're looking at a 50 year fight. Whereas if we introduce a minister for men and we say, this is what you have to do. This is this is government responsibility to do this. What, what I, I would, um, what I would envisage is that they then become on an equal pathway into everything that women are already present. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that could take 12 months, you know, because the, the pathways are already set. The communication systems are already set, you know, the voices that are already set. It's just you need that man's voice in there to counterbalance that and give what men need. Um, okay. So, to, you know, sorry. Okay, let's imagine then the SNP decides to appoint a men's minister. Mm. I mean, who are they going to make the men's minister that's going to do a remotely decent job in terms of challenging? If, the, if, if, they, if they had to put in a man, it would pro probably be a transgender man. I would agree that in a, in a very... If the SMP would create this position, it would very clearly be filled by a feminist who would actually say the big problem that men face is their masculinity and we just have to get rid of their masculinity and potentially their their genitals to uh, rid them of their problems. But yeah. I think uh, at, at the current moment in the UK government in Westminster, there is a real chance to actually get somebody in who is more balanced. That would yeah. be my hope. Yeah. Uh, but, Scotland, uh, at, at the moment, I, at the moment in Scotland, we are fighting the big fight against the the SNP, and unless this fight is is not not won, but as at least as until we we gain some ground, there is no hope in Scotland. Unfortunately, I'm mm -hmm. quite pessimistic in it, that regard. You know, the Scot Scotland does have a government-funded men's organisation. Are you aware of that? White, white no. ribbon. It's called oh. White Ribbon, and it exists yeah. to, to turn men into feminists. Yes, I, I'm I'm well aware of White Ribbon. I actually um, I joined a feminist meeting in that was in Sterling, and the meeting was called uh, "Face Facing Down the Opposition." And since I'm the opposition of feminism, oh yeah, you were there as well, of course, Richard. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we both went there and I and I have to say that all the feminists there, the female feminists, they were, in my opinion, absolutely OK compared to the representatives of White Ribbon. They were so far down the indoctrination route that they actually had to be put in place by the female feminists because the people from White Ribbon said, Oh, in the universities, how can you destroy the patriarchy in areas like um, literature and journalism? And then the feminist students from literature and journalism, they said, what are you talking about? That has been in feminist hands for decades. They literally mm -hmm. said that. Mm -hmm. So they had to put the white ribbon people in place because mm -hmm. they were so out of touch with reality <laughs> yeah right well, well thank you very much our, our time has more than gone but we're, uh, okay. it was fascinating just to, so thanks very much sally Ann. i'm no, sure you can being a come real back at another point and uh, share some more of your insight with us okay thank and, you uh, it's been such a pleasure it really has been right and, uh, keep up the good work i will do my and, best uh, yeah i'll see you again right good night everyone thanks good for watching good night bye bye and, uh, good night thank you See you, you in uh, August when we restart again. Right. Good night. Bye bye.